Good morning. If you're a guest, we're so glad you're here. Please know that all people of faith are welcome to receive communion, especially today. Today, um, our children who helped out yesterday in the children's celebration are going to help pass out communion. And I think it's going to be an incredibly profound experience. Um, and also today is an instructed Eucharist. So I have a disclaimer. Um, the danger of an instructed Eucharist is that in trying to explain why and how we worship, it gets in the way of actually worshiping. So I've strategically placed comments in ways that hopefully won't do that. And so, especially once we start the Eucharistic prayer, we won't have any commentary from me until the end of the service. Um, and in addition to my comments, you can ask questions, uh, time permitting, um, during the sermon. And we have special bread today that the children made at the Children's Saturday, thanks to two 8 o'clockers, Susan Cloutier and Sandra Jones. So it was great. The 8 and the 10 came together yesterday. Um, so instructed Eucharist, the word Eucharist is a Greek word meaning thanksgiving. So it's kind of like we're having a Thanksgiving meal where the Christian family gets together to give thanks to God, to share stories, to hear how we're doing, and to go out uh, nourished and refreshed to do uh, what God has given us to do. Um, some people coming from different traditions might know other words for the Eucharist. Uh, the Mass, Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, Orthodox tradition, it's the divine liturgy. I mean, how amazing is that? You know, if you didn't think it was elevated, you walk in and something's called the divine liturgy, you know you're doing something special. So throughout the service, um, I'll be talking a little uh, bit, and I just want to start with this one quote by Soren Kierkegaard, who is a Danish philosoph philosopher and theologian. He wrote... Although many people assume that worship is a performance in which God is the prompter, the pastor or priest is the performer, and the congregation is the audience, it is more properly understood as a performance in which the pastor is the prompter, the members of the congregation are the performers, and God is the audience. Liturgy actually means the work of the people. So from this perspective, I hate to tell you this, but according to Soren, it matters little if the music or prayers please us, but it matters a great deal if they please God. Perhaps the question we need to ask is this, not how do I feel at the end of worship, but how does God feel when our worship is over? Is God inspired? So just a little thought to begin our worship today. Our opening hymn, which can be found in the blue hymnal, is 410. And are we doing all, all the verses? Yes, yes, all the verses, 410.
We continue in our Red Book of Common Prayer on page 354. 355, excuse me. And just a reminder, we have blue inserts in the hymnals. This is our service music for the fall, and it's service music used at the Iona community in Scotland. So when it comes time, here's where the service music is. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. be with you. with you. Let us pray. O oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated, and while the first reader is coming up, So the prayer we just prayed is called the Collect of the Day, and it generally sets the theme for the day. It's loosely connected. You'll hear echoes uh, in the scripture lessons. Now, the scripture lessons, when the early followers of Jesus, they just kind of got together, and they shared stories, and they broke bread, and they shared wine. And little by little... Um, people like Paul, the apostle, went around and founded churches, and then he'd write letters to those churches. And so people would read those, and they were really popular, so they'd kind of share them a little amongst churches, a little bit like baseball cards, maybe even. And then they would also read from their own scripture, the Hebrew scriptures, because in the beginning, at least, the church was mostly Jewish, and Jesus was Jewish. And then, a little bit later... People started, before people forgot, they started compiling the stories of Jesus into books. And there were many books, four of which we have today that the church has recognized, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those are called Gospels, because the Gospel means good news, specifically the good news about Jesus. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. At that time, it will be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a hot wind comes from me out of bare heights in the desert toward my poor people, not to winnow or cleanse, a wind too strong for that. Now it is I who speak in judgment against them, for my people are foolish. They do not know me. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil, but do not know how to do good. I looked on the earth, and lo, it was waste and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and lo, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and lo, there was no one at all, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked, and lo, the fruitful land was a desert, and all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. 
For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be a desolation, yet I will not make a full end. Because of this the earth shall mourn, and the heavens above grow black. For I have spoken, I have purposed, I have not relented, nor will I turn back. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of Psalm 14. I will read up to the asterisk, and you will respond by reading after the asterisk. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The Lord looks down from heaven upon us all. Everyone has proved faithless. All alike have turned bad. Have they no knowledge, all those evildoers? See how they tremble with fear. Their aim is to confound the plans of the afflicted. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come out of Zion. The second reading is from the first letter of Paul to Timothy. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Our sequence image is 405 in the kingdom. 405.
stand for the gospel because those are stories about Jesus. And so we stand out of respect and reverence. However, I'm going to use the Sparks Story Bible today. And so you can be seated because I'm going to see if there's any little kids or any kids who want to come help me with this. You want to come help me? You want to come help me, Maddie? No? Okay. You can come. You want to come help me? Come help me. All right. I'm going to sit here. All right, see? So, why don't you guys sit down so everybody can see. So this is a great little Bible, and we're using it in our Sunday school curriculum, so it's a shameless plug. It's not shameless. It's a great plug. And these uh, children's Bibles kind of help children understand. And so the trick of a children's Bible is to make it simple without changing the meaning. Some Bibles... I won't ever recommend because it's got that church's slant on the story. So there's already too much commentary on it. But the Sparks Bible and the Sparks curriculum is a great curriculum. So this is a story that is in a sign for today already. And it's about uh, Jesus tells two parables about getting lost. It's the lost sheep and the lost coin. All right. So you can look over here if you want to see these pictures. Telling stories was Jesus' favorite way to teach people about God. He said once there was a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. He loved them all, the big ones and the little ones, the good ones and the naughty ones. They were his sheep and he loved them. Sounds like moms and dads, huh? Every day this shepherd counted his sheep to make sure they were all safe. One day he counted only 99 sheep. That meant how many were missing? One. One. That's right. One was missing. Right away, the shepherd left the 99 sheep together and went to look for the one that was lost. Hi, Rowan. Hi, buddy. Look at your fingers. All right. The shepherd listened for the lost sheep. What was the shepherd listening for? What do sheep say? That's right. Bah! Who can say that with me? Bah! Do you think any adults would be childlike enough to say that? Bah! All right. He looked in all the places that sheep might get stuck or in trouble. It took a while, but guess what? The shepherd kept looking until he found the missing one. Then he called to all his friends and neighbors. Come on over, he cried. I found my sheep. Let's have a party. Because he was so happy, right? And then Jesus told another story. I have another story, Jesus said. Once there was a woman, and she had ten little silver coins. One day when she was counting them, she discovered that she had lost one. What do you think she did? Did she think to herself, oh, well, I've still got nine, so who cares about one? What do you think? Do you think they did that? She said that? No. No, she didn't. She lit her lamp and swept the house from top to bottom. She looked under and over and around everything in her house until she found that lost coin. Can you see where, can you find where that lost coin is? It's kind of hidden. You see where it is? Yeah, right there. That's right. It was hidden. So then she was so happy, she too had a party to celebrate. God is like this shepherd and this woman, you know, Jesus said. God would never stop looking for someone who was lost. Never, ever, ever. Has anybody ever gotten lost? Yeah, what happened? Who found you? You found your way back, okay. Well, sometimes little kids get lost and and their parents look all over the place and they find them. And that's like God. God's always going to look for us. If we feel lost, God's there to help find us. I don't know if he can help you with math tests. (laughs) All right. Thank you, you guys. You can go back and sit down. So this is something we're going to read from on the Family Mass Sundays because almost all of the reading almost all the gospels are in here and it's a way to include our children more in worship on those Sundays 
The thing is, a sermon is to take the gospel and all the lessons and figure out how we can, I can, as the preacher can interpret them, to connect with your lives. Karl Barth, a Swiss theologian, said, um, take your Bible and take your newspaper. Read them both, but interpret the newspaper from your Bible. See, it's important that we address the issues of the world, but we need to do that with an understanding of our faith. So, some people gave me some questions ahead of time. Uh, I answered uh, two of them at 8 o'clock, so for the sake of everybody here, I'm not going to go and do that again because those people heard their answers at the 8 o'clock. Um, but before I address the other one, I'm wondering, this is a time where you can ask me, and I will do my best to answer you. Now, remember, I'm part Irish, so you might not get the right answer, but you'll get a good story, <laughs> a good explanation. All right, anybody have any questions about the service? You need me to prime the pump with one? All right, I'll prime the pump with one, and then you might get it. Um, I mean, people ask about candles. People ask about anything. So this one um, is, why do people bow towards the altar as they approach or walk past? Is that a requirement, or is it just a personal choice? All right, so someone like me, I grew up congregationalist. We didn't bow. We didn't do anything like that. But what I learned, because becoming an Episcopalian and a priest, I had to learn that, is different churches and different people have different piety or different ways they express their faith. And so when you see people bowing, there's, there's two types of bows, actually. There's the head bob, okay, the simple bow, and then there's the solemn bow, right? And those who choose to do that, there's also the curtsy, the genuflect, like this. That's a little harder as you get older. <laughs> what people are doing who choose to do that, and it's, it, by the way, it's not mandatory. It might be uh, part of a tradition of one parish over another, but if that's part of your piety, you should feel comfortable. Again, but understanding. And so this person who doesn't come from that tradition wants to understand so the main thing that we're showing reverence to, if we choose to do that, is the reserve sacrament that's in there. That's why we have that lit candle. It lets us know that we have some reserve sacrament in there. And we believe that Jesus is truly present with us in the reserve sacrament. So that's why we might bow to that. Also, the altar, because this is where the sacred meal happens, we might choose to reverence that. You'll also see sometimes... Uh, when the cross is processed in, people will bow to the cross because that is the ultimate sacrifice where Jesus showed us his love. You don't have to, but that is a tradition in many churches and in this tradition too. It's kind of like standing or kneeling. In the prayer book, it says that um, people may stand or they may kneel during the Eucharistic prayer. What's important is decide what helps you be in an attitude of worship? Does kneeling help you do that? Do you want to still kneel, but your knees won't let you anymore? So then do you do kind of like that sit kneel or just a sit? Or do you, does, does standing help you stand for prayer? Because that was the ancient church's stance. You, you stood. Um, what's just important is after we sing the Sanctus, right, in the Eucharist, you just decide what you're going to do. Right? I, sometimes I wait five seconds for people to kneel, and they don't. So sometimes I just go ahead, and then people are like, oh my gosh, i got to kneel now. Um, it's up to you. It is what helps you worship. So after we do the glory, if you want to keep standing for prayer, stand for prayer. If you want to kneel, that's the time to kneel. So it's, it's up to you. So did that prime the pump a little bit? Any questions? Oh, come on, the eight o'clockers were more than you. Yes, Deb. Right. And what about like saying amen you get Okay. All right. So here's another thing. When I was in seminary and I was at this church, I said to my uh, priest that, um, that I was reporting to, because I grew up congregations, okay, so a lack of understanding. So I said, why do people cross themselves? And she says, why don't you try it for a week or two, and then we'll talk. So I did. I was like, oh, wow. Like, Chakra, chakra, you know. No, I won't get into that. But, 
But it's a very tactile thing. And what she said is, at, um, many people will cross themselves, kind of, it's kind of like bowing. Right? Sometimes when the cross comes in, people will cross themselves instead of bow. It's a way to remember this is a sacred moment. And so uh, when we say the triune name of God, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, at the beginning of the service, or the blessing at the end, you'll see people cross themselves. Some people cross themselves when the um, bread and wine is elevated. Some people cross themselves during the Sanctus, which is, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord, because it's a very special moment. A lot of things, I don't want to like burst people's bubble, but a lot of, the reason why people cross themselves there is in the ancient Roman Mass, when the priest was at the altar, and the priest was doing his thing in Latin, and the congregation didn't receive anything, right? It was just the priest up there. While the choir sang the Sanctus, and they got to the Benedictus, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the priest would lift up by then the consecrated elements, right? Because he was doing his thing while the incredible choir was singing through the Mass. And so when the people saw that that was lifted up, that was the closest they were going to get. And so they crossed themselves. Yes, Steve. This morning. Mm-hmm. Jewish tradition, right? And it's very hard. Mm-hmm. It's nasty and tough. Right. Um, are we supposed to believe that something like that happened, or is it an allegory? So that's a very good point, because not only in the Hebrew Scripture, but some of Jesus' sayings are pretty tough. You know, and when I read those gospel lessons, I notice this little hesitation saying, praise to you, Lord Christ. And there was a little hesitation today on thanks be to God. Like, are we really supposed to be thankful for this? There is some scripture. So in the Episcopal Church, we believe that the scripture is inspired by God, but it's not inerrant. Some more conservative and fundamentalist churches believe that scripture is inerrant. It means that God, every word is true by God. Every word. And you read some lessons in whether the Hebrew scripture or the Christian scripture, you know, the New Testament, and you wonder, is did this literally happen? Is this really God's will? Right? And you have to use your brain. And so that's why Karl Barth said, use your Bible, use your newspaper, but also in the Episcopal tradition, use your reason and grapple with the scriptures. You know, um, who was it? Augustine of Hippo, in his day, everything was interpreted allegorically. Right? And so there are many ways to understand scripture. Uh, one preacher I heard once said, you know, now I know this is true. I don't know if it actually happened this way. Right? So sometimes people feel like you're splitting hairs. But uh, as one priest's wife said years ago, no one was there at Genesis to know it was six days. Right? That this is trying to tell us a truth. And what truth can we get out of it? And some of the readings are really hard, especially because in Hebrew times, they were trying to understand in a very violent and, um, you know, people being sacrificed to the gods. It was just a seismic shift away from that towards um, understanding God in a whole new way. And so you see that being worked out in scripture. Yeah, but there's some scripture that I'm like, nah, I don't know. I don't know if it really happened that way. Thank you. Yes? Okay, so we have banners. So that's another thing in certain churches. You know, we're Episcopalians. We like a little ceremony, right? We like the candles on the altar. We like we bring out the good uh, the good um, vessels and stuff. This actually, Barbara uh, told me this was made by an inmate at the women's prison for us, who played on our softball team, and so she wanted to make this with us. And we do this from Easter on. So, because we don't, I, I haven't found a banner just for, like, this time of day. But this is an Easter season one that we've kept out. But isn't it nice? Yeah, thank you. And what's the second one? I have a question. Um, the, the gospel, uh, uh, there's a special way across the Yes. So, that's another way. Again, it's 
See, we do the same thing every week, and so it's very easy for it to become rote or to get distracted. And for me, crossing myself or bowing or um, marking for the gospel is a reminder to me that when I read the gospel and when we listen to the gospel, may it be in our heads, may it be on our lips, and may it be in our heart. So little rituals. Yes, Rosemary. It's more fancy on the back, right? Than on the front. Mm-hmm. What is that? What does it signify? Probably the cross of Christ, a banner for Christ, because he's the Lamb of God. That's Jesus right there. And that's probably, I don't know, I'm, good. I'm making it up here, Rosemary, so. <laughs> I don't know what the white and red one is. St. George's Cross, there we go, maybe, yeah. What is it? Yeah. But the important thing is that that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And these vestments, a lot of vestments were made before the 79 prayer book, before the priest faced the people in worship. And so that's why the fancy is not on the front, the fancy is on the back, because this altar used to be up there. And so the priest would do this. The first part, the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Blah, 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 blah. And then the priest would turn around and for the rest of the service wouldn't be looking at you. And so that's why the fancy was on the back. Thank you. You're welcome. The different colors. So a different. So again, we're not plain Janes here as Episcopalians. We. You know, we like to ritualize, we like to symbolize, we like to use our senses, right, and our eyes. And so this is the season after Pentecost. Some traditions call it ordinary time. And so it's a time of growth. And so we have the green. Same with Epiphany, the season after Epiphany. It's a time when we learn about our faith and grow in our faith, green. But there are times when we use white, Right? At Easter, at Christmas, uh, for baptisms and funerals, it's when we talk about new life coming into the world. When Jesus was born, new life coming into the world with Jesus' resurrection. And when we have a baptism, that's celebrating new life. When we have a funeral, we're celebrating resurrected life. Also, in uh, a wedding, we're celebrating new life of this couple. Um, red is for Pentecost. It's the sign of the Spirit, but also for martyrs. Right? Or for apostles. Um, purple is a sign of royalty and penance. And so we have that during Advent and Lent. Some Episcopal churches use blue during Ad- Advent because there was a color in Canterbury, the serum blue for Advent. But we keep purple. All right. Oh, James. Okay, and then we got to move on. So, Oh, and then I'll, 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 I'll get... Right there. Yes. So St. Matthew's is the physical church here in Boston. Right. This is a liturgical question. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we perform a liturgy uh-huh. that has somewhat been adjusted, and as, as uh, rectors have uh, um, uh, authority, and then you see that it's a modified of liturgy to what they think would work best for the congregation. Mm-hmm. Well, if you go into an Episcopal church, most will be using this Book of Common Prayer. Most will have communion every week. Um, Some Episcopal churches print out the service front to back, start to finish, including the hymns and little uh, bulletins that have everything in it. We don't do that. Um, And so... This is called the Book of Common Prayer because this is the structure that we use. If we're, you know, at 8 o'clock we were right one, at 10 o'clock we're right two. We did Eucharistic Prayer 2 at 8 o'clock. We're going to do Prayer B, I think, at 10 o'clock. So there's lots of, it's like granimals, right? There's lots of different ways to do it. 
but you're still within this general framework that the Episcopal Church has set forth for worship. And there's a lot of leniency and variety along uh, on those ways, which hymns you pick, which prayer you pick, things like that. Yes? One. Yeah, one. Okay. Yes. So this is a symbol for the Trinity. So you have the Trinity, and then you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So one God, three persons. Now we're about to, thank you for that, we're about to go on to the Nicene Creed, the prayers, the peace. Now the Nicene Creed, uh, to some people, feels really foreign because, it's, remember, it's uh, fourth century Greek philosophical thought. But it was to set forth the parameters of what we believe because in the early church, different people were stressing different things. And so the church came to a consensus of what is the outline of our faith. The first creed was just three words, though. And it was very political. Not partisan, but political. So when, the, when someone says that the church shouldn't be political, I always remind them the first creed was this. Jesus is Lord. Now, how, how is that political? Well, at the time, you were supposed to go around and say, Caesar is Lord. So that, that's got a lot of chutzpah. So go around and say, Jesus is Lord instead of Caesar is Lord. And so when we stand up and we say, uh, we, we recite the Nicene Creed, we're using ancient words uh, to talk about our faith. And then we go into the prayers because that's a response. We want to lift up what's on our heart. We want to lift up our, our country and the world. We want to lift up the environment. We want to lift up those who are suffering. We want to rejoice with things that people are rejoicing about. And so we offer all that up to God. And then because we want to be right with God and one another, in most of the seasons we have a confession where we can unburden ourselves of what's uh, weighing us down and be reminded of God's absolute forgiveness so that we can approach this altar in peace and uh, with a sound and good mind. So now let us stand and recite the Nicene Creed found on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God of God, light and light, who We'll be using Form 4, page 388 in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Rob, our bishop, Nancy, our rector, and for grandparents everywhere. 
Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. We give thanks to, for all known to us who celebrate birthdays this week, including Tessa Carboneau, Sarah Catugno, Sarah Reed, and Sherry Maloney. And for those known to us celebrating anniversaries this week, including Roger and Diane Macon, and Bruce and Lisa Jukes. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them to the joy of your salvation. We pray for all who work for peace worldwide and for those for whom our prayers for healing and encouragement are asked today. Caleb, Judy, Barbara, George, Brad, Jean, Ed, Jim, and Judith Ann, and for healing within ourselves and for those in our thoughts and hearts today. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Using the prayer on page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand for the peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace, 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 Kevin. Again, please know that all people of faith are welcome to receive communion at this altar rail. We're using bread that was baked by the children yesterday. The eight o'clockers gave it two thumbs up. If you need gluten-free, just let me know. Also, the children will be helping distribute it, those who were uh, here yesterday. Walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
to go right over here. Go over here. There we go. All right, great. All right. Okay. You stand right here. Oh, you want to stand there? Then you can see better. Okay. You can stand right up here. You can stand up here if you want to see better. Stand up there. All right. Now, are there any others who practiced yesterday who want to come forward? I kind of see. Okay. So some people chose not to. That's okay. Now, the offertory is, the, mo- the money we give is a symbol of offering ourselves, our souls and bodies up to God. In Africa, you would see chickens. You'd see, you'd see all sorts of things being offered up to God. And this bread and wine is a reminder that God, through Jesus, is offering God's self to us for our nourishment and for our sustenance. So we, ca- so we continue with Eucharistic Prayer B, found on page 367. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. give you thanks, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, and the calling of Israel to be your people, and your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of... Can you want me to hold you and then you can see better? No, you, you're good. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> we pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection unto your Christ, And bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Want to stand up? trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Thank you. 